Climate Week, and everything about this week is big, right? The announcements, the partnerships, the commitments, so everything about it makes us feel just hopefully a little bit better about what our future holds for us. And today, when we think about this, usually it's built upon the tiny engagements, the tiny interactions, the casual conversations, the tiny technologies that somebody forgot about or didn't realize the significance of. And that's actually what I want to talk about today, is not the big things, but actually the small things that can help us get to big impact. Because we need to triple nuclear energy by 2050. And I want to talk about our nuclear future. And the way that we're going to talk about this is in a couple of different ways. We want to talk about the reactors. We want to talk about the waste. We want to talk about the waste timelines because all of these, we think that there's an opportunity to talk about them in a small, productive way. So let's talk about the reactors. About 20 years ago, the Department of Energy and others within the community recognized that nuclear wasn't really fitting the bill as we had commonly thought about it. The big gigawatt scale reactors just were over cost, over budget, causing a lot of issues from that type of deployment perspective. And we said, you know what, maybe it's time for a different technology. Let's talk about the small modular reactor. And with this, we can de-risk construction, financial, regulatory, supply chain. All of these things might just get a little bit easier if we shrink the size of the reactor and leverage economies of number instead of economies of scale. So that was about 20 years ago. About 10 years ago, we started having a conversation that maybe we didn't go small enough. Maybe we actually need to be thinking about it at the micro reactor scale because we hadn't fully de-risked supply chain, financing, manufacturing in a way that we could catch this flywheel to produce what we needed to do. And that was about when ARPA-E walked in the scene with respect to our first adventures with the nuclear fission space. And we hosted a workshop on micro-reactor technologies. And from that workshop, what we actually founded was the Meitner program. And we basically funded our first technology in the space, the Evinci micro-reactor. And maybe the slide, there we are. The Evinci micro-reactor. And at this point, there were about one or two micro-reactor companies that were operating in this space, at least domestically. And what we've seen since then since about the decade that we, we started having this conversation, put in some of the earliest, if not the earliest, government funding into micro-reactor technologies, is that now we have about a dozen domestic companies that are investing in this space and wanting to develop these types of technologies. And this is a very different landscape than we, we started this conversation as far as where we thought we would be with respect to small nuclear technologies. And right now, when we're thinking about this, usually we're having this conversation with respect to, hey, wouldn't these be great in forward deployed military bases? Wouldn't these be great with respect to remote operations that could help promote communities? And maybe we should actually be having the conversation that these reactors can fit on, the, on basically a truck bed. And if that's the case, why aren't we talking about mass manufacture of these types of technologies? And if there's anything that the nuclear community maybe hasn't done too well of, it's mass manufacture. Maybe that's why we're not having that conversation. And so this is actually a perfect opportunity for me to hear, be here talking to you all because it's not going to be the nuclear community at its core that helps figure out the mass manufacture challenge so we can bring these types of technologies to bed sooner. It's gonna be people who know manufacturing in aviation, automotive, batteries so we can think about our reactor design and coordination in the way just from the beginning so we can actually produce this forward because when it comes to micro reactor technology we're getting ready to deploy some of these at idaho national lab by 2026 and probably at that micro reactor workshop about a decade ago if you had said you know what and we're going to build and deploy one of these within 10 years you would have been laughed out of the room but that's actually the conversation that we're having right now and i think that we could be really leaning into this with respect to how we could potentially triple nuclear by 2050. So that's the reactor side. Now, let's talk about the waste. 
Well, I think everybody would be okay if the waist was just a little bit smaller. So one of the key ways that we could have this conversation is when it comes to nuclear fuel recycling. It turns out that when you pull your waste or your fuel from the reactor and it's been lightly used, you've only used about 95% of the energy value from that material, 95%. This would be like if you drove your Ford Explorer, you filled it up 20 gallons, burned one gallon of gas, and threw the other 19 gallons away. This just doesn't make sense, but this is currently what we do when it comes to nuclear fuel and waste management of the waste. And the biggest reason why we do that right now is because it basically is too expensive relative to fresh fuel, and actually it generates pure plutonium streams. That's right. That plutonium, that is used in nuclear weapons, and therefore you have a proliferation risk on your hand. And so we went back and looked at this as an agency, and this is actually where my core background and expertise lays. And we said, you know, there's not a reason a priori why the technologies need to be this expensive. When we developed these technologies originally during the Cold War and during the Manhattan Project, cost was not the design basis. It was other factors. And so we might have picked fundamentally different technologies. Now that we've worked with plutonium for more than just a few years, we might pick different technologies that are a little bit more cost effective. Oh, and by the way, if you're designing for recycling this fuel to put it back into the reactor, there's no need to generate a pure plutonium stream. And you can actually develop the chemistry and the controls to help manage it that way. And that's exactly what we've done with two programs at the agency, with Curie and Onwards, that focus on nuclear fuel recycling. And from those programs, we actually have three companies that we're working with, amongst others, that are helping us understand the opportunities in different chemistries and different approaches that could help us recycle our nuclear fuel in a cost-competitive way that would actually help us manage the proliferation risk of the material. And so this is the way that we can start thinking about nuclear fuel recycling, to not only decrease our waste by about an order of magnitude, but actually improve our nuclear fuel utilization by about a hundredfold. And if you're talking about tripling nuclear by 2050, you'd like to have a good, secure fuel supply chain. And so that's one thing that we can talk about with respect to about waste vol volumes. So now let's talk about fuel timelines. Everybody, waste timelines, everybody else's favorite topic when it comes to nuclear. The idea that, of course, we know when we pull nuclear waste out of the ground, it sticks around for milli <laughs> Whoops. millions of years, right? This is something that causes some issues as far as disposal, management. We know that we can take the fuel and put it safely alongside the reactor, and we've done this for decades now at this point, but you start having the conversation about millions of years, and this is something that many people are not particularly comfortable with. Well, now about what instead of talking about millions of years, we were talking about something on the order of 30 years. What if we took our fuel and transmuted it basically such that the long-lived products actually didn't stick around for so long. And we thought about this in the 70s when we decided that we would do deep geological disposal. The reason why we stayed away from this was because basically at the time the particle accelerator technologies and other things weren't there yet. And we didn't think that it made sense to take this approach with respect to the management of our fuel. That has changed. Funny enough, probably because of advancements in fusion. We are getting much better at making particle accelerators that are compact more intense, have better uptimes. And this is why we launched the Newton program at ARPA-E, a $40 million effort to ask the question of should we be transmuting our nuclear waste and can we get there in a way that makes sense, that completely changes what the back end of our nuclear fuel cycle looks like. And so these are the ways, and there's actually a lot of opportunity with this for new people to have this conversation and think about what could be the potential when it comes to nuclear fuel transmutation. And so all of this in total, when it comes to thinking small, I think that there's a lot of opportunities for newcomers to engage within this space. But it turns out that this is just one pathway. Of course, there's been big announcements this week. There were big announcements last week. Microsoft, $16 million, Three Mile Island Unit 1. Financial Times report about bankers coming forward willing to finance nuclear projects. And so when it comes to making our path forward to tripling nuclear by 2050, we actually think that there's a couple of different pathways to get there, and now you know a little bit about a small one that could get us there. So thank you for your time.